What do Schlitz, Olympia, and Rheingold have in common? They share a tremendous downfall. But if you think it was only caused by prohibition, you might be wrong. We'll tell you exactly what brought about their tragic end as we discuss the backstories and nostalgic moments of all three of them. But also, two others that you will most likely remember, miss and want back. Which was most likely the case for... Schlitz. Our beloved Schlitz beer had massive success back in the late 1960s, but later stumbled. So what exactly happened there? Schlitz introduced later on a more efficient brewing process called accelerated batch fermentation. It was discussed to be able to produce lighter beer at a lower cost, but everyone who was living their best life at this time knew the real deal. The change was made at the expense of the Schlitz beer quality, and that was literally the start of the end. The story of Schlitz's downfall is a nearly unbelievable tale if you are not there. Schlitz, once a prominent rival to Budweiser in the American beer market, faced a colossal decline attributed to two key events in the late 1970s, and you won't guess what exactly happened there. The first key event was obviously the new recipe, which was just not as good as the old one. They tried to tell everybody it was good, but it really was not. People were furious, but what the brewery did then was unimaginable. Instead of actually working on the product itself, they did what every major company would do. Can you guess it? Exactly. They just put all their money into marketing and hope that will change the public opinion of the beer. Spoiler alert, it did not. But the actual TV ad campaign itself was a catastrophe. People were literally so upset that it was even allowed to say things like this on television. The ad campaign featured rugged men aggressively promoting Schlitz in a manner that frightened viewers. I mean, honestly, the campaign backfired, earning the nickname Drink Schlitz or We'll Kill You, and was pulled off the air after just two months due to public backlash. They tried very hard to rebrand, but the damage was already done. The reputation suffered irreparable damage, and the downtrend continued. Schlitz's decline was also influenced by cost-cutting measures and a disastrous reformulation in the 1970s. In an effort to reduce expenses, Schlitz compromised on quality even further on top of the already bad recipe, leading to a decline in taste and consumer satisfaction. Do you also remember how their beer once tasted and over the years just got worse? This in combination with a few more bad management decisions led to its downfall. By the time Pabst Blue Ribbon acquired Schlitz, its reputation had diminished even more. But what are they doing now? They are remaining a shadow of their former selves, relegated to the lower end of the market. Its decline serves as a cautionary tale of the consequences of prioritizing cost-cutting over quality and failing to adapt to what the customers really want. A good freaking beer for a reasonable price. Remember the name Pabst Blue Ribbon? They play a crucial part in the story about our next beer. Every one of us has our own story about the next beer or knows somebody who does. The good old Stroh's. Stroh's. Stroh beer was once an iconic brand from Detroit and was known for its special brewing technique, which I will explain a little bit later. The story traces back to the immigrant roots of the Stroh family in Detroit and their journey in establishing a successful brewing business since the mid-19th century. The Stroh family had faced, like many other brew companies, a lot of setbacks and challenges during Prohibition. They tried hard to survive by diversifying into other products like soda pop and ice cream and their resurgence in the post-war era. Stroh's rose to prominence in the Detroit area for its unique taste, which most of you still remember to this date. The secret sauce that Stroh used was a special brew technique I mentioned a bit earlier, and what they did was, they used an old technique instead of the modern methods of steam. They heated the kettles directly with gas flames. The high heat underneath the kettle slightly caramelized the malt sugars in the wort, which was said to give Stroh's their unique flavor. However, the brewery faced more difficulties during the late 20th century, including bankruptcy and the impact of a major brewery strike in 1958. Despite efforts to expand nationally and compete with other beer giants, such as through innovative advertising campaigns, Stroh ultimately struggled with high costs and ceased operations at its Detroit brewery in 1985, marking the end of an era for Detroit-made beer. Our next beer is also full of tradition, but has a major event that turned it upside down straight into misery. Rheingold Do you remember the first time you took a sip of a Rheingold? I do, and I remember the taste to this date. But what exactly happened to this beautiful brand? 
Let's start with their origin story. Rheingold Brewery was founded in 1883 by Samuel Liebman and his sons. They got pretty fast to become a prominent beer producer, and at its peak, Rheingold was the leading beer in New York State, with a market share of up to 35% in the 1940s and 1950s. Absolutely remarkable. However, the company faced challenges in the 1960s due to rising costs and increased competition. After a few more years of hard struggles and setbacks, the family decided it would be best to sell the whole brand before they would be empty-handed in the long run. And one hell of a giant decided to take this brand over and make it profitable as soon as possible. You all know this brand. Some love it, some hate it. So, in 1964, the Liebman family sold the brewery to Pepsi-Cola United Bottlers. Massive ownership changes followed, with the brewery being sold again, but this time to Christian Schmidt Brewing Company in 1977, then to G. Heilemann Brewing Company in 1987, and eventually to Stroh Brewery Company in 1996. So, the traditional brand of Rheingold went through a lot of transformation phases, which also led to many different ideas about how to run a brewing company that ultimately resulted in failure, or at least stagnation, and a loss of interest in market share. Despite various ownership changes, Rheingold Beard continued to be produced intermittently, with periods of discontinuation. Mike Mataro, a beer industry executive, relaunched Rheingold Beer in 1998 under Rheingold Brewing Company Incorporated. The brand was later sold to Pabst Brewing Company in 1999. Oh man, this Pabst Brewing Company. We already heard this name a few times today. I'm starting to recognize a pattern of failure caused by this conglomerate, and then to Drinks Americas in 2005. But 25 years earlier was one of the turning points for this brand, a dark day in the books of beer enthusiasts like you and me. Some of you might still remember it, but for those who don't, the Rheingold Brewing Building in Brooklyn was completely demolished in 1981. It was a horrible day for the management and the brewery itself, as well as another setback in finances and stress. Throughout its history, Rheingold Beer has experienced fluctuations in production and availability, but it remains a notable part of the beer industry, which is why it got mentioned here. The next one on our list today will most likely trigger some good emotions because of its legendary status among beer connoisseurs in Canada. Lucky Lager A quick question for all the Canadians here. Do you remember the unique taste of a freshly brewed Lucky Lager? It was one of the best tastes, and it was actually a beer that kind of failed in the USA but thrived in Canada. But what exactly went downhill from the beer that has its roots in California? In 1934, they aimed to compete with European lagers, prioritizing quality and simplicity in their marketing. Despite its Californian roots, Lucky Lager found significant success in Canada, where it became a beloved brand adopted by locals. The beer's packaging, featuring a prominent red X, became iconic and underwent minimal changes over the years. While Lucky Lager struggled in the US market and eventually ceased production there, it thrived in Canada, particularly in Vancouver, where it became synonymous with local pride. Labatt Brewing Company, which acquired Lucky Lager, continued to brew and distribute it in Canada, maintaining its popularity. In the US, the brand is now owned by Pabst Brewing Company. I mean, honestly, at this point, who else? Of course it was Pabst Brewing Company. Despite its complex history, Lucky Lager remains a nostalgic favorite for many, symbolizing a unique blend of American and Canadian beer culture. Olympia for the next one, I kindly ask you to answer this question in your head. For what is Germany known for? I mean, the positive things. Yes, for engineering and good beers. So why not combine them? That is exactly what Leopold Schmidt, a German immigrant with a lot of knowledge of German brewing, did in 1846. He started the Olympia Company in Washington, which was initially named Capital Brewing Company before changing to Olympia Brewing Company in 1902. Known for its distinctive gold and white packaging featuring a horseshoe label and the slogan, It's the Water, Olympia Beer ceased production in 2020 after 125 years of brewing. That was kind of foreshadowing, but what exactly happened? Throughout its history, Olympia Beer underwent several ownership changes, including being sold to G. Heilemann Brewing Company in 1980 and later to Pabst Brewing Company in 1999. In the first 30 seconds of the video, I already told you there is a fate all this brewery shares. And one thing is that ownership changes, and most of the time, Paps Brewing is involved. They have a successful track record of playing a huge role in the tremendous downfalls of the beers that we once loved. 
Besides that, the reason it was stopped in 2020 was the decline in beer sales. Simple as that, the ownership was just not able to market a legendary brand like the Olympia and decide to focus their resources on other brands. Our next one on the list is a beer that you might not have expected to be here on the list or even forgot about, but it's worth staying and hearing the success story of another beer from Milwaukee. Blatt's The Blatt's Brewing Company, founded in 1851, as I said, in the wonderful area of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, by Valentin Blatt's, emerged as one of the city's prominent industrial brewing giants. It originated from the John Braun City Brewery, established in 1846, with Blatt's later acquired after Braun's death. Blatt's quickly modernized the brewery, expanding its production and introducing innovative brewing techniques. But you will not believe that Blatt's was ahead of its time. And Blatt's was the first Milwaukee brewery to establish a bottling department in 1875, enabling national distribution of its bottled beer. Despite a tragic fire in 1872 that damaged the original brewery, Blatt seized the opportunity to modernize and expand its facilities. By the 1880s, production exceeded 100,000 barrels annually, and the brewery spanned three city blocks. Their genius strategy to expand their business might surprise you. Instead of only growing sales and beverages, they decided to go into the real estate market more aggressively. They acquired significant Milwaukee real estate by the late 19th century, including the Blatt's Pleasant Valley Park Beer Garden and the Blatt's Hotel. In 1891, Blatt's was sold to the British syndicate United States Brewing Company. During Prohibition, Blatt's managed to survive by producing malt syrup, sodas, and near beer until beer production resumed in 1933. Post-Prohibition, the brewery was sold multiple times. Blatt's experienced success with national marketing campaigns in the post-war era. But it struggled to keep pace with industry expansion and modernization, eventually being purchased by Pabst Brewing Company in 1958. Pabst's acquisition of Blatt's led to the closure of the brewery in 1959, followed by a federal antitrust suit challenging the sale. Ultimately, Pabst sold Blatt's to G. Heileman Brewing Company in 1969. Although a new Blatt's brewery was constructed in 1986, it closed in 1989 due to underwhelming sales and was later sold to Miller. Today, the original Blatt's Brewing Complex has been rebuilt into private apartments for the Milwaukee School of Engineering while the Blatt's brand remains part of the Pabst Brewing Company's portfolio. I mean, at this point, is it even a surprise to you that also Pabst Brewing is still in some way connected to the iconic brand? This is the best outcome for a dead beer. At least it's doing good for our youth.